So by the end of the talk, what I'm hoping is that we'll have defined the types of varices that develop in portal hypertension. I'll review a little bit about the pathophysiology and risk factors for variceal development because that's really at the crux of most of our therapies. So it felt really important to go over the pathophysiology. Um, a little bit about the epidemiology of varices and specifically variceal bleeding. And then to update you on the current management strategies for variceal hemorrhage, our most recent guidelines from liver societies have been updated within the past year. So some of these, uh, some may be new evidence, but really to cover the management strategies. And lastly, I'll end with going over the separate management of gastric variceal hemorrhage, which for those of uh, colleagues in the ICU right now, I know we share some mutual patients just in the last 24 hours that we've consulted on with this specific um, entity. So in terms of the subtypes of varices, there's four main subtypes. We'll spend most of the time talking about esophageal varices, which will be the focus of what you see um, in the ICU, and then gastric varices. So these two make up the bulk of what we manage, um, but you can develop ectopic varices. This could be anything from small bowel varices, um, some cecal or proximal, proximal colon varices. We can also see them around uh, stomal or peristomal varices, so that's what we mean by ectopic um, in nature. I'm not going to really be focusing on ectopic varices, though, just in the, in the interest of time. And lastly, rectal varices, varices which can also present, but also go not going to be the focus today. So mainly I'll spend time talking about the top two. So going to the pathophysiology, when we think about portal hypertension in patients who have liver disease, it's really at the core why the patients develop complications or specifically varices and represents an increase in the portosystemic gradient. There are a number of different etiologies for portal hypertension and on the next slide I'll show you a chart really going through those different etiologies. We're again going to focus on mainly sinusoidal causes or, or particularly but what I mean by that is cirrhosis in terms of causing portal hypertension. And varices can form regardless of what causes elevated portal pressure. So whether it's right heart failure, bud Chiari syndrome, isolated portal vein or splenic vein thrombosis, all of which can cause portal hypertension, these can all manifest with varices. And the way that we define portal hypertension is based on invasive pressure monitoring uh, through a hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement. And the way that this gradient is measured, which similar would be similar for you probably to getting a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, is that we start during the, during the test, what they're doing is inflating the balloon at the very, very distal tip of a hepatic vein uh, branch. And that is going to be essentially what we consider the wedged portal pressure. So it's estimating the pressure in the portal vein across the sinusoid. And then they're taking the pressure pointer here in the free hepatic vein. And it's that difference between the wedge pressure and the free hepatic vein pressure that gives us our pressure gradient. So that's the way that they perform that through interventional radiology. So I mentioned that there are different causes for elevated pressures or what causes portal hypertension. And really, again, the focus here is going to be sinusoidal causes, so mainly cirrhosis, in which case you're going to see an increase in the wedge pressure because on the portal side, on the portal vein, the pressure coming into the liver is high. Normal free hepatic vein pressure, and as a result of that, the gradient is going to be high. So this would be what we would see in the context of patients with cirrhosis who are portal hypertension, but included here I show what the different findings would be if it was, for example, right heart failure causing it, where you're going to have an increase in the wedge, increased free pressure, but really no gradient across the liver. So this is just um, a chart explaining that. So in patients with cirrhosis, when we do this pressure gradient measurement, a normal pressure gradient is actually defined as 3 to 5 millimeters of mercury. But then to define portal hypertension, a pressure gradient over 5 millimeters of mercury is, is uh, equated with a definition of portal hypertension, which we further classify into mild or clinically significant portal hypertension. And this is, again, using invasive pressure assessment with the pressure gradient through interventional radiology. Mild is defined as 6 to 9, and clinically significant is 10 or greater. And it's really at the clinically significant portal hypertension that patients are at risk for developing decompensation, which is mainly why our patients would be coming to the intensive care unit. So whether that's ascites, uh, variceal bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy, 
really see that at this point when they have clinically significant portal hypertension. Particularly at a pressure gradient over 12, they're at a higher risk for developing variceal hemorrhage. And that's going to be important when we talk about therapies such as TIPS, for example, to reduce pressure gradients. We really want to get them to the under 12 to lower their risk of variceal hemorrhage. Doing this actual pressure gradient assessment is more accurate than just doing a liver biopsy for determining if somebody's at risk of decompensating. So if we just did a biopsy, it tells us important information about the amount of scarring in the liver. It can tell us about the etiology of the liver disease, but it really does not tell us about one's portal hypertension and their risk of decompensation. But in the United States in particular, we don't do a lot of invasive pressure monitoring. Most of the studies looking at hepatic venous pressure gradients and improvements on therapy come out of Europe, where they tend to do pressure monitoring more frequently than we do. We certainly send some patients for this, but not very commonly. So I wanted to include what are some other non-invasive ways that we assess for portal hypertension. So if you see visible spider nevi in patients who have cirrhosis or abdominal portosystemic collaterals on their exam, that, is, that can be very informative that saying somebody has clinically significant portal hypertension. A low platelet count in and of itself does not have high accuracy for, for being reflective of clinically significant portal hypertension. But in indices that combine it with splenomegaly or combine it with FibroScan, which is a test we'll go into shortly, certainly the low platelet count can be useful but in and of itself has a low accuracy for defining portal hypertension. There are certain imaging findings that are highly specific for portal hypertension. On an ultrasound, you can look for collateralization. And on a CT or MRI, which often our patients would end up having, you're going to look for a recanalized para-umbilical vein, 100% specific for clinically significant portal hypertension. Spontaneous splenorenal shunting or gastrorenal shunting, which they often mention on an IV contrast-based cross-sectional imaging. Dilated left and short gastric veins, which ultimately are what feed into the development of esophageal varices. If you see that on cross-sectional imaging, that also defines portal hypertension. Or reversal of flow in the portal system. So they'll refer to this as hepatofugal flow, or basically the flow is now going from outside more towards the center and backwards through the portal vein. That's causing that excess pressure and hence splenomegaly as a result. But they may use the term hepatofugal flow or reversal of flow in the portal system. So these are some of the, the buzzwords you look for on the imaging that equate with portal hypertension. Splenomegaly, just like thrombocytopenia in and of itself, low accuracy for portal hypertension. There are other causes. We see some patients who have fatty liver disease that don't actually have cirrhosis but have splenomegaly on imaging. Usually when we see this, we tend to do further testing, especially, for example, we get asked sometimes on patients who are being considered for lung or heart transplant, you know, and these findings are seen on imaging to risk stratify and whether or not patients have advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, or portal hypertension. Sometimes they may have splenomegaly, but that in and of itself doesn't always mean that they have portal hypertension, but many times will. Transient elastography is something we do much more commonly now in the last three years here at Henry Ford. And around the country, it's being done more commonly. It's called fiber scan. And when you order it in Epic, you can, it comes up as both terms, either fiber scan or transient elastography. This test for the patient feels like having an ultrasound done. It's a five-minute outpatient procedure. They come over to the K building. They put a probe over the liver. And it's a non-invasive way of assessing the stiffness of the liver. So they take 10 assessments across the liver of the stiffness. And based on that, the average gives correlates with certain values to tell us how much scarring has occurred in the liver. So this has largely replaced liver biopsy for many cases where we just wanted to know how much scar tissue has occurred in the liver. It doesn't tell us the cause of the liver disease, but is informative for the amount of scarring. So for portal hypertension, it actually performs very well in terms of discriminating mild or lack of portal hypertension to clinically significant portal hypertension. And the cutoff by kilopascals for the actual liver stiffness is 20 to 25. So when we put this report in EPIC, which just says fiber scan, you'll see at the bottom of it a score, which is the liver stiffness measurement. And that number would be anywhere from under 6 to up as high as in the 40s or 50s. So when you get above 20, it correlates well with um, likelihood of portal hypertension.
MR elastography is an emerging technique. Um, sorry, that arrow's off there. Um, is an emerging technique and is something we do not currently do reliably here at Henry Ford. Certain centers around the country are starting to adopt this more, but mainly in the research arena. I think we will see in the next couple of years that we also adopt this tool and, and that we'll start to become more comfortable with in, interpreting the results of it. Mainly what it tells us is the degree of fibrosis, and it can also have some utility for defining clinically significant portal hypertension. We just don't know enough about it yet to use it on a regular basis. But it's a nice tool. So there are three main areas here that I wanted to capture on without going into all, all the description to get at why patients ultimately develop portal hypertension. So there's when we look at it from pathophysiology standpoint, I break it down into three parts here from this slide. The cirrhosis itself, the splanchnic circulation, and the impact on systemic circulation. So at the level of the cirrhotic liver, you're getting increased hepatic vascular resistance. And that's actually occurring mainly because of two things. One is the structural changes in the liver from the nodules, the fibrosis, and broad bands of scar. And that makes up 70% of why you get the increased hepatic vascular resistance. And the other 30%, so that was the architectural disturbances, the other 30% is the increase in hepatic vascular tone. That occurs largely because in the microenvironment of the liver, there's a reduction in nitric oxide and uh, other, um, other vasoconstrictors, and as a result of that, or an increase in other vasoconstrictors, and you get that increased hepatic vascular resistance. So that's one reason that you get this portal hypertension. Then how that feeds into the splanchnic system is through three main mechanisms. One is that in the splanchnic circulation, you actually get an increase in nit nitric oxide. And as a result, vasodilation of the splanchnic circulation and increased portal inflow into the liver. You also have defective response to vasoconstrictors within the splanchnic circulation and neoangiogenesis. And as a result, you form collaterals. And altogether, this feeds into more portal flow into the liver. So we have the first two mechanisms. One is the vascular resistance. The other is the increased portal flow feeding into portal hypertension. And the third really is the impact on the systemic circulation. So when you get the vasodilation of the splanchnic, uh, splanchnic arterioles, as a result, the body senses a decrease in effective blood volume, translates into hypotension, and activates neurohumoral factors that result in increased sodium and water retention. As a result, you get a hyperdynamic uh, circulatory state with an increase in cardiac output and cardiac index. And that all together, again, feeds back into the increased portocollateral flow and into portal hypertension. So three main mechanisms by which that happens. So I mentioned that with significant portal hypertension, you're at a higher risk of decompensation. So variceal hemorrhage, ascites, post-surgical decompensation, and hepatocellular carcinoma. So for our purposes, because I mentioned earlier, we don't often do the pressure gradient measurements. Um, and in patients who are in the intensive care unit, we can't readily bring them over to the K building and do the fiber scan test. So one thing we may look at is just when we do the endoscopy, if we see varices, if we see varices in a patient with cirrhosis, by definition, they have clinically significant portal hypertension. So we don't really have to do further testing to define if they have portal hypertension or not. Then we further go into whether they have compensated or decompensated liver disease. And this slide that I borrowed from the ASLD guidelines that were updated last year shows you that these are patients who start off all with compensated cirrhosis. And we just talked about how they can then be, have mild hyper portal hypertension or clinically significant portal hypertension. When you have clinically significant portal hypertension, 30 to 40% of them at any one time will have varices. So not everybody has varices just because they have portal hypertension. And what we're trying to prevent is the progression onto decompensation, which is defined by variceal hemorrhage, ascites, or encephalopathy. And then, of course, you see many patients who present to the ICU who are now at the state of further decompensation, refractory ascites, recurrent hemorrhage, and ultimately higher risk for death. So we care about this because cirrhosis in the U.S. is the fifth leading cause of adult deaths. This is as of 2014, and the eighth most common major cause uh, of major, Ill co most costly major illness, chronic illness in the United States. So these are the part of the reason that we care about it. And the impact on survival is 
is very different between compensated and decompensated state. So in compensated cirrhosis, median survival is reported at about 12 years. Once they get to the decompensated phase, even with the first variceal hemorrhage, it's about 1.8 years. So if their only decompensation is one episode of variceal hemorrhage, they have no ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, hyponatremia, nothing else to define decompensation, at five years, their mortality risk is 20%. But if that variceal hemorrhage is accompanied or soon after followed by further decompensation, it significantly impacts their prognosis with an 80% mortality at five years. And probably one thing that you care about you know, from the critical care standpoint is their short-term mortality. With this entity, most studies, larger studies, define the primary endpoint as six-week mortality from variceal hemorrhage. And just to show you kind of how we've done over the last few decades in terms of managing this and the outcomes, in 1986, the six-week mortality from variceal hemorrhage was reported as 40%. Currently, most recently, 15 to 25%. So still pretty significant. I mean, certainly a reduction, but we have a ways to go with this. Um, the prevalence of varices and cirrhosis in all patients with cirrhosis is 50%. So I mentioned earlier, not everybody will have them. Even in portal hypertension, not everybody will have varices. And in patients who have compensated cirrhosis, they will develop varices at a rate of 7 to 8% per year. But once they are decompensated, up to 85% of them will have varices. And the progression from small grade 1 varices to grade 3 large varices happens at a rate of about 10 to 12% per year, so pretty significant. And the risk of variceal hemorrhage once they get to the decompensated state is about 10 to 15% per year. So the features we look for to say that somebody's higher risk for bleeding, and this was actually done back in, this is the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1988, which was a prospective study basically following patients to see what were the higher risk features that resulted in somebody bleeding, and those are severity of liver disease, so if they have child's PUC, size of the varices, so medium or large, red whale marks, which basically represent areas where the vein or the, the varices are very thin, have a thin wall, and the pressure gradient over 20, millimeter, 20 millimeters of mercury, and a concomitant bacterial infection. So this is a picture here of the red whale marks. So if you watch us do scopes, sometimes we'll see this. This is just the thinning of the wall of the varices. And this is different than certain other high-risk stigmata that you can see, which I'll, I'll show you in coming slide. So the goals of treatment for esophageal varices is to control the bleeding, of course, the preventing early recurrence, defined as the first five days, and preventing six-week mortality, which we talked about as kind of the primary endpoint in a lot of studies. Um, this is, of course, a, a a critical illness requiring ICU level care and the first most important part is adequate resuscitation. So this study you guys are probably familiar with from 2013 that looked at a strategy, a randomized patients to liberal transfusion strategy versus a more restrictive strategy. Liberal defined as targeting a hemoglobin of 9 to 11 um, as opposed to the restrictive strategy where transfusion was done with a threshold of 7 and maintained between 7 to 9 for their hemoglobin. In this, they also had a cohort of patients, about a quarter of the patients, that were cirrhotic. With this, they found that with the restrictive strategy for transfusion, maintaining the hemoglobin between 7 to 9, there was a lower risk of re-bleeding from variceal hemorrhage and lower mortality rate. That benefit was mainly seen in child pew A and B cirrhosis, less so in child pew C, probably just because of their just how sick they are overall and their risk at that point where perhaps the transfusion strategy didn't really make a difference in their ultimate outcome. Correction of coagulopathy has not really shown to be of benefit from the purpose of achieving hemostasis in patients with variceal hemorrhage or risk of re-bleeding or short-term morta mortality. So there were two randomized control trials looking at recombinant factor 7A, both small number of patients, um, that did not show clear benefit of correcting coagulopathy in this setting. And INR, as you know, is an unreliable indicator in cirrhosis. It is thought to be a procoagulant state, but certainly um, has features of both, and, and we don't really know how to accurately use that INR to translate into bleeding risk. There's also no data to support platelet transfusion in variceal hemorrhage.
But antibiotics are certainly very important. So after the resuscitation strategy, then next most important is to think about starting IV antibiotics in the setting of acute variceal hemorrhage. Uh, lots of nice randomized data to support this and meta-analyses looking at the randomized data which show a decreased risk of bacterial infections if you use IV antibiotics, a decreased early re-bleeding risk, so defined as the first five days after the initial index bleed, and a decreased risk of mortality due to variceal hemorrhage. So this really is recommended to be started for all patients coming in with variceal hemorrhage, but the data is probably the weakest in the child's PUA setting. But until we have better prospective studies of this, which we probably will not do, necessarily um, just given the, the benefit that we've seen with IV antibiotics in this context, it's recommended to start it on all patients coming in with this. Right now we give ceftriaxone one gram daily, and that's largely due to high rates of quinolone resistance that have been seen uh, to emerge, and it's usually for up to seven days duration. And I kind of emphasize the up to seven days because it doesn't mean you have to continue it for the full seven days. If the patient's in the hospital, certainly very reasonable to do so. But we do have some patients, few, but some who do make it out of the hospital at day five, for example, and have had control of bleeding early on. They're no longer on a vasoactive agent, and it's been a day or two since they've, had, uh, since they've achieved hemostasis, and we can then discontinue the antibiotics if it allows them to get home. Um, these, in terms of vasoactive agents, this is the ne next thing, and most of these things are going to occur at the same time as, as you guys do, but um, these are all IV infusions, so you really want to start octreotide, in our, in our case, uh, prior to endoscopy. This has been shown nicely to improve control of bleeding and lower the transfusion requirements. And in a meta-analysis of 30 randomized controlled trials, it showed a nice reduction in mortality, of all-cause mortality at seven days. So this is why we give uh, IV vasoactive agents, specifically octreotide, although terlipressin and somatostatin are also used, not in the United States, though, um, for control of bleeding. So we use octreotide, as I mentioned, and it really improves the control of bleeding. It works by being a somatostatin analog and causes splanchnic vasoconstriction. So as a result, you get decreased portal inflow, and by doing so, then reduces portal pressure. The duration of octreotide is two to five days. So this, again, depends on when you achieve hemostasis, how long the patient's going to remain hospitalized. Um, it's recommended to be continued for that duration of time, somewhere between two to five days. An endoscopic evaluation should be done within 12 hours of presentation. So how do you know that you have a variceal source? Where clearly, if there's active bleeding from varices, that's one way that we know. But here's some high-risk stigmata that we look for. So on the prior slide, I showed you the red whale sign, which is just areas where the wall is thin. Here you see cherry red spots from recent bleeding. And this is a white nipple sign, which is a fibrin plug from recent hemorrhage. So these are some of the high-risk stigmata when we report in the uh, procedure note that we saw high-risk features or that there was absence of high-risk features. These are three of the things that we are looking for. So if it's not really clear initially, you know, when you go in with a scope, they're not actively bleeding. There are other ways that we kind of infer that this may have been a variceal source of bleeding. One is that if there's no other cause seen and there's actually active, there's heme in the stomach. And the other is if it's been over 24 hours since the last bleeding episode and you see no other cause. So we have, there, there's a patient we just saw last night and scoped um, that some of you guys are taking care of probably right now. And it was this case. It had been over 24 hours since the prior endoscopy. There was a report of he uh, hematemesis as the cause for transfer. When we went in, there was no heme, no old or fresh blood. But then on retroflexion, there was a nice uh, gas, large gastric varix with a white uh, nipple sign or fibrin plug sitting on there. So there were no other lesions to cause the bleeding. And we can infer that clearly that was the cause um, of bleeding. 20% of, of esophageal variceal bleeds will be refractory to ligation. So this is something you guys see in the ICU as well. They're associated with a high mortality rate. And this is where bridge therapy is important. So bridge therapy is basically through a mechanism of tamponade. So putting pressure directly on the varices. With balloon tamponade, you achieve hemostasis in about 80% of cases. But in hospital, mortality is about 20%. 
these patients. You can use balloon tamponade for up to, for a maximum of 24 hours. And the options really that we tend to use is either Blakemore tube or Minnesota tube. I think that we, in the unit we have Minnesota tubes. Is that right? Okay. Um, so this is the difference between the two because depending on where you practice, you may have one or the other that they carry in the hospital. So mainly the difference between the Blakemore tube and the Minnesota tube is the presence of the, uh, is the, presence of the esophageal suction. So in the Minnesota tube, it's basically four lumens, whereas in the Blakemore tube, it's three. Um, so you guys have used this before. You know you, you, in some cases, will inflate the esophageal balloon, but most commonly the gastric balloon. You have the gastric aspiration port, which is down here as well. But again, in the Minnesota tube, they add the esophageal aspiration port. There are adverse events that can be associated with it, hemorrhage, depending on the location of placement, certainly pain due to the pressure and possible necrosis associated with that if it's been left in too long. Esophageal perforation, um, that's why the placement is very key in knowing which balloon you're inflating and to what uh, pressure you're inflating it. Upper airway obstruction, again, if the balloon migrates. And cardiac arrhythmias, mainly due to the presence being so close to the atria. So there's another way of achieving tamponade, and that's through self-expandable covered metal stents for the esophagus. So in hepatology, two years ago now, there's a multicenter randomized trial that was published, and there have been other studies, cohort studies, looking at this. This trial had 28 patients enrolled and stratified to either have balloon tamponade through a Blakemore tube or self-expandable covered metal stent for refractory variceal hemorrhage. They found no difference in survival at six weeks. You can see 54 percent versus 40 percent, but that was not significantly different. But there was improved control of bleeding with the expandable metal stem. Um, they did find that there was more, their tips was more commonly done in the tamponade group. So this was also probably goes along with the improved control of bleeding with the metal stent. There was a lower risk of adverse events with the metal stent as well. The advantage to the stent is that you can remove it by day seven. So it gives you a few more days to work with because with, of course, balloon tamponade, we talked about <coughs> deflating within 24 hours. Uh, but the stent you can actually leave in place for up to seven days. And there were some patients in the trial that even had it up to 14 days. So this is what it looks like. So at the top, here on the proximal end, it has this thing called the gold marker. And then it has the radiopaque markers on the distal end. So it goes in and it self-expands. This is done under fluoroscopy. So of course the patient has to be stable enough, which is generally not the case in these patients, of course, to have this done with the C arm. They go in, they expand the stent. This gold marker allows for future removal. So they can basically loop the gold marker and pull the stent out around by day seven. And with the radiopaque markers, you can understand the distal most end of the stent. So I'm talking to our colleagues in therapeutic endoscopy here and about whether or not this is something that they would consider. They've discussed it. I, I think that the main challenge is, of course, having or needing flora, fluoroscopy and how we do that in the context of somebody who has basically a refractory variceal hemorrhage. So that's one concern. The other concern is about migration after you've placed it because it is going to self-expand after that. And what if you have proximal or distal migration in that context? If somebody bleeds despite having this in, it can be very messy to remove it and then try to apply further endoscopic therapy in that context. So these are the challenges, but there are some centers that are adopting use of this in some <coughs> patients. So you may hear of that. So now turning to TIPS, or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. So the main indications for a TIPS is for persistent bleeding despite combination therapy. So variceal ligation and vasoactive agents. So you're doing that, they're still bleeding, TIPS should be considered. The other is severe re-bleeding after you've initial, initially achieved hemostasis despite this combination therapy. So there are two strategies. One is the preemptive strategy, or early TIPS, within 72 hours of admission. This has been associated or shown in the study in the New England Journal in 2010 to be associated with lower re-bleeding rates and mortality rates. This has not really been replicated since that study in a rigorous fashion, but it is something we have certainly considered more or thought about in the early time period more as a result of this. But it really should be for selected high-risk patients. So those would be your child's pew class C patients or those with child's pew class B and have ongoing persistent bleeding during the endoscopy. The initial trial, and I'll show some of the data on the next slide, 
really selected patients. So ultimately, it was only 20% of patients that you would otherwise consider for TIPS in this who they allowed to participate in the trial. So they were very, very um, highly selected patients. So who they included were 63 patients randomized to the combination of ARCL ligation and pharmacotherapy versus early TIPS, again, within 72 hours of admission. And the median follow-up was actually pretty lengthy at 16 months. In terms of re-bleeding rates and failure of therapy, it was much higher in the combination therapy compared to early TIPS. But seven patients had to cross over to receive TIPS as a rescue therapy. That was seven patients who were initially in the combination variceal ligation and medicine group. Mortality rates were also lower with um, the early TIPS strategy, and that was significant. And the length of stay in the ICU was longer in the combined therapy group as opposed to the TIPS patients. Similar risk of, of serious adverse events were seen. Again, I mentioned it's a highly selected population, and so we really need to confirm, confirm this with larger trials. But it is something that we always think of now as a result of this, that we think about whether or not we should institute TIPS earlier in the equation instead of waiting until the next episode of bleeding, mainly for the higher risk patients. Can you go back to yeah, certainly. Similar uh, adverse event yeah. rates. Does that include hepatic It did in this study. So and for the patients, and it was 63 patients, so a small number, but it was at 16 month follow up. So, okay. but uh, again, it gets back to the point they were really selecting very carefully in the early tips. So less than 20 percent of the patients that kind of walked in the door that you would have said, okay, maybe we should consider tips at this point for it they selected out patients who had a history of encephalopathy that, was, that were on medication for that. So that may have also impacted their risk of developing it after. So TIPS is this connection that they make, the shunt. This is done through interventional radiology, which is in 90% of the cases is going to be a shunt created between the right <coughs> hepatic vein and the right portal vein. That is ideal. That's the angle that they want to achieve, as opposed to going from the middle hepatic vein to the right portal. When that happens in about 10% of cases where it's a technically challenging TIPS, we tend not to see as good of pressure reductions afterwards. So that's why ideally they like to go from the right to the right in most cases. So these are the contraindications to TIPS, both absolute and relative contraindications. So some of the absolute ones, and I won't go through every detail here, but most of the things to be aware of is Primary prevention of aerosol bleeding, we do not recommend TIPS for. So if somebody comes in, they have large esophageal varices but no history of bleeding, we don't recommend TIPS in that context because there's no data to support doing it. Congestive heart failure is a contraindication to putting a TIPS in. Uncontrolled infection, so active infection you're treating them for. Recently resolved infection, so let's say they've had SBP, reassess their fluid, it's now cleared, you could consider putting a TIPS at that point. But active infection, you're treating with antibiotics, we generally rec recommend against a TIPS due to the concern for infecting the TIPS. Unrelieved biliary obstruction and severe pulmonary hypertension. These are some of the absolute contraindications. Uh, the other thing is if they have HCC or hepatoma, Depending on its location, it may be a contraindication to TIPS, but it's not the case that just because you have liver cancer that you cannot get a TIPS. If it's a centrally located one, certainly we, we advise against it, but it just depends on its location in relation to where they would place the shunt. Portal vein thrombosis is not an absolute contraindication. It depends on the extent of the thrombosis, how chronic it is in nature. Uh, sometimes they can work with the portal vein thrombosis. So I would tell you that if that is the only thing on imaging that you see and you think, well, that might not be a reason to proceed with TIPS, best to talk to IR, have them review cross-sectional imaging before making that determination. A moderate pulmonary hypertension is a relative contraindication, and then overt hepatic encephalopathy. So this is something we always think about on our patients before recommending TIPS, um, especially if they're already on lactulose and rifaximin. It really comes down to how urgent is the indication, which generally when we're seeing patients um, in the ICU, it's going to be urgent. Um, and then really how controlled are they on their medication? Is this a context in which we can control their encephalopathy just with medical management? We do have the potential to reverse the TIPS or occlude it if needed, but of course that's not preferred. Um, so it's not an absolute contraindication, but something we take into account. <coughs> 
So this isn't the greatest image, but I wanted to include this, and I put this in pretty last minute into this talk to show you, because this question does come up for us, or, or we think about this, is what are kind of the meld cutoffs, or how sick is can somebody be uh, before we consider you know, saying TIPS is too high risk? So this study, which is probably the best data on this, published a few years ago now, showed that right around a meld cutoff of 18 or above, you see the 90-day mortality rate after a TIPS really increase considerably. Um, so this Kaplan-Meier curve shows that as well in terms of survival. And you can see that distinction with the melds 18 and under versus over 19, 19 and above. We don't always still say no, because again, usually it's urgent and there's no other better option for many of these patients. But what it comes down to is what are the components of that meld? You know, is it driven by their creatinine? Is this ATN driving their creatinine to be elevated, but their bilirubin is three and their INR is more reasonable? Well, then we'd say, okay, well, in this case, this is not a contraindication. But if their meld is largely represented by hyperbilirubinemia, significant coagulopathy, we might say, well, their 90-day mortality is so high. I'll tell you, there's few circumstances, though, when it's truly urgent and we have no other better option where we'll say it's an absolute contraindication to move forward, generally because you do not have any other good alternative. But it's just counseling the patient's family and understanding that with this, they may develop worsening liver failure. And especially if they're not on a transplant list in that context, we may, may not be able to turn that around. So that's why I included this. It's just um, why we think about MELD in these patients. So this is an algorithm kind of summarizing what we discussed thus far in terms of the management. So suspected variceal bleed, start the vasoactive drugs, uh, so octreotide, prophylactic antibiotics, and resuscitation, EGD within 12 hours. If they have a bleed, we're going to do band ligation. I didn't really talk about sclerotherapy. We don't tend to do it too much, but if we need to during the scope, we will apply it. Um, endoscopic band ligation. If you control the bleeding, great. Continue the vasoactive drugs for two to five days and then start long-term treatment, which we'll discuss in subsequent slides. If you don't achieve control of bleeding, evaluate the severity. If it's moderate, maybe consider repeat endoscopy, especially if the first scope was not done here. Um, we want to take our own look and see what's going on, see if we can achieve endoscopic control. But if it's severe bleeding that's ongoing, either balloon tamponade or TIPS, surgical shunt, surgery here is for surgical shunt, um, which we really don't do very much of anymore. So uh, that's the algorithm thus far. Questions right now, or I'll, I'll move on. Yeah. So, based on this algorithm, mm -hmm. where would you, you know, where would we then look at our balloon tamponade? Because I think a lot of times we're after earlier on, uh, just without any other kind of immediate system control, right? As, as a tamponade device, yeah. leading until other things can be instituted. Right. Yeah. No, it's a great question, and. It's not, there isn't really an easy answer in that except to say that, you know, I would tell you that if they're getting hemodynamically unstable and we feel, one, we either can't get in to scope them, you know, right away to do it either because they need resuscitation or they can't go to IR immediately because we don't know exactly what the source is. Nobody's done an endoscopy to take a look yet. Um, or IR is not immediately available to do it. They feel the patient's too unstable. Balloon tamponade should be done in that context. But it really should be ideally with the same call, you know, same time calling GI on call, calling IR, and to see the patient. Um, but other than the hemodynamic instability, not really a clear-cut answer. Sometimes we will do it if we can't achieve hemostasis during the endoscopy. And we feel that, okay, this patient now needs to get to more definitive management either with TIPS or BRTO, which I'll show soon, but that we need more information, whether it's cross-sectional imaging or an echocardiogram before proceeding down that route. That may be another context in which we need to achieve temporary hemostasis with balloon tamponade and recommend it in that case. But it's going to be just for under 24 hours, ideally, until you can decide another plan or move towards palliative measures and buys you time to have that discussion with the family. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, so preventing re-bleeding is very important in this context, short-term as well as long-term. In the first year, patients have a risk of re-bleeding of 60% and mortality rate with re-bleeding of up to 33%. So we talked about continuing actreotide for two to five days. 
And then the first line prevention after that would be a combination of non-selective beta blocker and variceal ligation. And in this meta-analysis of 476 patients altogether of all the studies included, they looked at combination therapy, beta blocker plus variceal ligation, or variceal ligation alone, or medications alone as the strategy for preventing rebleeding. And what they see, this is your meta-analysis for, for, um, forest plots, is on uh, the left here, rebleeding. On the right, rebleeding rates. Below is mortality rates. And so if you look at the combination of variceal ligation and medication compared to ligation alone, it favors the combination of therapy for risk, uh, decre decreased risk of rebleeding. Similarly, for risk of mortality, short-term mortality, it fa favors the combination therapy. But if you compare that to the combo versus drug therapy alone, so just non-selective beta blocker, in some studies it was non-selective beta blocker paired with isosorbide mononitrate, again, for rebleeding rates, it favors combination therapy, but when you look at mortality, kind of crosses one or gets close to one there and really t seems to show that of these two in the combination therapy, probably the pharmacologic agent is the one that's more powerful in reducing the risk of mortality from rebleeding. And the reason that's relevant is that if a patient is unable to tolerate non-selective beta blockers, not just right in the hospital, but even for us on follow-up, then we importantly want to think about TIPS earlier, just because that seems to carry the greater weight in preventing mortality from rebleeding. So the goal of beta blocker therapy is to decrease flow to the splanchnic circulation, hence to the liver. So just to review the mechanisms of this, the beta-1 blockade is mainly to decrease portal flow um, through decreasing cardiac output. We talked about the hyperdynamic state at the beginning um, in the flow that develops in the context of decompensated cirrhosis. And so this is to decrease portal flow. Beta-2 blockade is going to result in unopposed alpha activity. And as a result, you get splanchnic vasoconstriction and less portal inflow. So in the non-selective beta blocker, the beta-2 component tends to carry the greater weight of prevention in, in these patients. Most commonly, we use propranol or natalol, but there certainly are high-quality high data for support of carvedilol use. Um, and as an alpha blocker, you do get the additional benefit in the beta and alpha blockade of d resulting in some vasodilation of the intrahepatic circulation. So when we talked about the decreased nitric oxide in the intrahepatics, it causes increased resistance to flow. So if you use the alpha blockade and you add that in our um, non-selective beta blocker therapy, then it can result in some vasodilation improvement in flow through the liver. So you do see in, this tr in the trials that have been done with carvedilol a greater pressure gradient reduction compared to propranolol or natalol. The challenge for many of our patients and why we don't use it that commonly, unless they're already on it, um, is because it tends to be associated with a greater decrease in mean arterial pressure. So a lot of our patients don't necessarily tolerate that, especially by the point that they're decompensated. So a lot has been written recently, or you may have heard, you know, that there's been a lot of questioning the benefit or utility of beta blockers for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So I just wanted to spend a minute talking about that. There are studies showing the benefit of non-selective beta blockers uh, in the setting of decompensated cirrhosis and those showing that we may actually be increasing their short-term mortality as a result. And that's because it can alter the hyperdynamic circulatory state. So really, right now, the guidance is that um, you want to consider that this is going to occur or have a negative impact on patients in a very small subset of decompensated cirrhotics. And those would be those patients with refractory ascites and a, um, a systolic blood pressure under 90, refractory ascites with hyponatremia under 130, refractory ascites and in the setting of AKI, and refractory ascites and SBP. So these are the patients where we say or we should consider saying, probably the risk is greater to continue a non-selective beta blocker than the benefit we may achieve for secondary bleeding prophylaxis. It is not recommended to continue a beta blocker for patients who have a functioning tip. So once you have a TIPS in and you achieve good pressure reduction, we'll talk about what that pressure reduction is in a minute, but once you do that, you no longer need to continue the non-selective beta blocker. So to summarize the, non the secondary bleeding prophylaxis, propranolol, start and titrate up, which again, mainly that's kind of what we do in clinic, 
We aim for resting heart rate of 50 to 55 if tolerated by the patient. And the reason for that is because we use that as a surrogate to the hepatic venous pressure gradient reduction. If you're at a place where they do pressure gradient or invasive monitoring more regularly, then that's what you'd be relying on. But we assess heart rate. A lot of our patients don't tolerate doses high enough to get to that resting heart rate or they develop considerable fatigue. Um, but that's really just from a literature standpoint what you're aiming for. Natalol is our other choice for once daily option. And then we continue variceal ligation every two to four weeks until you've obliterated the varices. So sometimes in our patients that we see inpatient, we say, well, we'll come back and do another scope in two weeks. By that point, they may be out of the ICU, but they may be on um, the regular floor. And we tend to then, if they stay for two or three weeks, we like to repeat the scope before they go home. Otherwise, we do it as an outpatient. So tips can also be used for recurrent bleeding. If they have recurrent bleeding despite the combination therapy of ligation and non-selective beta blockers. So when you look at the current covered tips, which are the coded tips, Sean, so which is what's been in use for some years now, um, versus endoscopic ligation, there's a lower re-bleeding rate associated with tips. Of course, it should work excellently if you achieve good pressure reduction, but equivalent survival in these patients, and certainly a higher risk of encephalopathy with tips. So that is the risk that patients carry in this setting. The hepatic venous pressure gradient reduction is the most important consideration. So we want to get to under 12 millimeters of mercury, mercury or greater than 20% reduction from their baseline pressure gradient. When you look at a radiology report after the tips, one of the things that they put at the bottom is the pre-tips pressure gradient, the post-tips gradient. And so it's that post-tips gradient that you're looking for to be under, to be reduced by 20% from prior to the tips, or ideally to get under 12. That's why I mentioned that if you can get from the right hepatic vein to the right portal, you generally achieve that. But if they can't, or for technical reasons, or, or perhaps others, sometimes you'll get a pressure reduction, but their gradient is still 20 are still at high risk for decompensation at that point. So that's just important to keep in mind um, that the risk is still elevated. Um, in, in this randomized trial that I put here, this was from 2015, of covered tips versus using pressure-guided medical therapy alone, no ligation in these patients, re-bleeding rates um, were lower in those who had the tips, equivalent survival again in both of these studies, and a higher risk of encephalopathy post-tips. So it is a preferred strategy from the context of decreasing re-bleeding rates. So let's turn to gastric varices. Um, so gastric varices are defined by the Sarin classification. In 1992, he came up with this classification, gastroesophageal varices type 1. These are the gastric varices that are contiguous with esophageal varices shown in the blue. So gastroesophageal varices basically connect with the esophageal varices. This is type 2 gastroesophageal varices along the fundus. And then what's called isolated gastric varices. And isolated, ga isolated gastric varices that tend to be in the antrum or type 2. So sometimes we'll put that in our report just to indicate the location of them and whether they're continuous with an, uh, esophageal varices or not. This is a picture depicting large gastric varices. So really large veins. No high-risk stigmata here, aside from the fact that they're just, they're large. So in 20% of patients with cirrhosis, you'll see gastric varices. That doesn't mean that all those are at risk for bleeding, but 20% of them will have them. And type 1 is the most common. So that's the one that's here shown, continuous with esophageal varices and right here at the cardia. Risk factors for bleeding, the location matters. So isolated gastric varices type 1 are most prone to bleed. Um, the type 2 gastroesophageal varices, so in the fundus, are the next most common. And then the ones that we see most commonly, the type 1s, are actually the least likely of those three um, to bleed. We look for the size, large size, just like in esophageal varices. That makes them more likely to bleed. How decompensated they are from child's pew status, so child's pew C, certainly more risk for bleeding. And then if they have a cherry red spot, or in the case of our patient yesterday that we scoped in the unit, uh, the white fibrin plug, these are all high risk stigmata. The initial management in terms of resuscitation, vasoactive agents, and antibiotics should be the same as that for esophageal varices. For the two types I mentioned that are at higher risk for bleeding, you do want to look for portal vein thrombosis or splenic vein thrombosis because those two types can develop in patients 
without cirrhosis. So they could have an isolated splenic vein thrombosis from pancreatitis or portal vein thrombus from a hypercoagulable state and as a result develop isolated varices, gastric varices, and not have any clear esophageal varices. So cross-sectional imaging is important to look for that. Um, the other thing, and, and I think this is pertinent only because I don't know who's rounding right now in the unit from the fellows, but uh, there's a patient yesterday we saw where this question came up. They wanted to get the glue injection into the gastric varics. A young individual who had heard about that and was really insistent that glue was the best management for gastric varics and wanted to go elsewhere to get that done. So um, injecting tissue adhesives or glue into gastric varices is a technique used in Asia very commonly for management of this. But in the U.S. there are some centers doing it. Um, we do not do this currently here at Henry Ford. So there are three randomized trials comparing the cyanoacrylate glue injections, which is a tissue adhesive versus endoscopic ligation. And in these trials, they saw a similar initial control of bleeding and a lower rebleeding rate with the glue injection. So it may have a more durable response than banding. In these trials, they mostly included just the type 1, which I mentioned is the one that tends to bleed the least, but is also continuous with esophageal varices. So there is a potential to band them. Generally, other types of gastric varices, you cannot achieve ligation because you can't get the band around the large size of them and actually tie up the tissue. Um, it's a limited option, really, here. The reason we don't do it is because you have to have a rigorous protocol to handle the tissue adhesives. It ruins the scopes, um, and that's why many centers don't do it. So I don't know of a center in Michigan that currently does it. I think uh, Case Western certainly does do it. That's probably our nearest option. In Pittsburgh, they do it as well. I don't know about places in Chicago, uh, but there are some centers that are adopting protocols for it. So we talked about how ligation is a limited option in this, these patients, and these tissue adhesives are not actually approved in the U.S., but in off-label fashion are being used at some centers. You should initiate a non-selective beta blocker if the gastric barracks is successfully treated with band ligation, so for secondary prophylaxis. And you can do TIPS for these patients and it achieves a very high rate of initial hemostasis. And this is generally the recommended treatment for the isolated gastric varices type 1 or GOVs 2, which are the most likely to bleed. Um, you can also at the same time embolize some of the collateral feeders. And so in the report, sometimes IR will say that, you know, we did TIPS plus com combine that with some embolization of some additional collaterals. There's no study that compares TIPS versus ligation or glue injection for initial hemostasis. So that we really don't have the data to say, you know, which, which is better for initial hemostasis just for the re-bleeding. And spontaneous cessation of bleeding from gastric varices can occur, but in those cases, uh, like the patient we scoped yesterday, where there was no active or recent bleeding in the, in the last prior few hours, we still should recommend TIPS or BRTO because there's such a high risk, over 90% of re-bleeding um, within the first year after an initial bleed from gastric varices. So some definitive management should happen before the patient leaves the hospital. So to decide between the two, we need to know about BRTO. So BRTO is balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. Um, this is done here at Henry Ford. The indication is for varices, gastric varices with large collaterals. So you're going to look on imaging, cross-sectional imaging for gastrorenal or splenorenal collaterals. The advantages to this over TIPS is that you're not shunting blood flow from the left side of the liver over to the right by putting a shunt in. Because when you do that in the context of a TIPS, some patients will run the risk of hepatic decompensation after TIPS because of that steel phenomenon. You also have no effect on hepatic encephalopathy, so that's the advantage here because you're not creating an actual shunt. The disadvantage is, is that you, as a result of closing off the spontaneous shunt, you increase the portal inflow, and that can worsen esophageal varices if they're present. It can worsen ascites, so the overall uh, portal hypertension may worsen. So you may need to actually combine the two, do a BRTO, and then at that same time assess pressure gradient measurements and combine that with the TIPS, which in some cases is done. Um, but generally when you're selecting one of these, it's because the other is usually contraindicated in a patient. So this is a diagram of BRTO, and this is what you're looking at in terms of the gastric varics. They go in through ephemeral approach, usually, into the left renal vein, find a spontaneous gastrorenal or splenorenal shunt, inflate a balloon to occlude the varics, inject sclerosin or coils into the gastric varics, and then deflate the balloon, and the procedure is completed. <laughs>
That's BRTL. Very simplified description of it. So these are our targets of our therapies. This is a summary slide to show you where, where our, our therapies actually work. So we talked about the mechanisms for portal hypertension. So if we look at the increased hepatic resistance, treating the underlying etiology of the liver disease can help the underlying structural changes if they have potential for reversibility. Carvedilol can decrease the intrahepatic resistance through its alpha blockade. TIPS also because you're creating a physical shunt in the liver. In terms of directly treating the varices but not influencing portal pressure, you can do endoscopic therapy, so ligation, sclerotherapy is another option, and BRTO. Okay, so that directly treats the varices but no impact on the portal hypertension within that actual varix. Um, in terms of increased portal venous flow, you can treat with non-selective beta blockers, and then similarly for splanchnic vasodilation, address that with non-selective beta blockers or octreotide. So I'm going to skip over the history of this, um, but just go to this very last slide because I just wanted to include a pearl about this. It seemed better to put it at the end than the beginning, now knowing the context. Is it, this is a diagram, a picture I saw came across from the 1500s of what their initial belief was of what portal hypertension looked like. And I can actually show you the bigger picture of it. Interestingly, in this you'll notice the liver is nowhere to be found in this. And that was because they really believed that this was a disease of the spleen. So they called it Banty syndrome uh, back up until the late 1800s because they thought that portal hypertension was really a, a disease of the spleen. And then ultimately came to learn and do this diagram of what's a surgical shunt and tried to create shunting through the liver. This was in the early uh, mid-1900s at that point when this was done. And then the Blakemore tube was developed in around 1950. And finally, our banders, by about mid-1990s, developed the banding kits that we use now, which achieve the multiple um, attempts of banding within one kit. So kind of neat to see the, the evolution of that. So in summary, um, varices form as a result of portal hypertension. The short-term mortality risk from acute variceal hemorrhage, so uh, the six-week mortality risk is 15 to 25 percent. Treatment should be early and aggressive through resuscitation, vasoactive agents, and IV antibiotics, and then as an endoscopic evaluation, ideally within 12 hours. Um, maybe with ligation at the same time. Early referral for TIPS can reduce the risk of re-bleeding, but in selected high-risk patients. We should institute secondary bleeding prophylaxis to reduce the re-bleeding risk, and that's most commonly going to be a, a combination of non-selective beta blocker and ligation. And then consider TIPS or BRTO for managing cardiofundal varices here in the U.S. because we don't have the glue adhesive here. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I went right up to time, but I can take any questions you guys have or stay after. Questions. So. Thank you. I hope, hope it was useful. Mm -hmm. I'll help see this one. Thanks. Just